Welcome to Talking to Ghosts. I'm Wes Mueller. And I'm Michael Kurt. And we're having conversations with creatives. Michael Kurt, who are we having a conversation with today? Corey Doctorow. Corey Doctorow. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Corey Doctorow, he is a uh, internet activist. A He's the co-editor of Boing Boing. He is a writer of several books and essays. That's right. Uh, he also blogs on the EFF's website. He was the... European director of uh, the EFF. I'm not sure. Uh, he he's like he took a break from being part of the EFF while still being an internet activist, and now he's he's, he's back in. He's back in. Yeah, and so we talked back mostly, in it. He, he's mostly here to promote his new book, Radicalized, which is a series of novellas, four novellas, which he talked about very eloquently. So yeah, I feel yeah. like we're good on that. Uh, yeah. And without any further ado, here is our interview. All right. So first of all, thanks for being on the podcast. Um, welcome to Portland in the rain. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's. Uh, I can tell I'm in the Pacific Northwest because there is unrestricted water falling from the sky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we were just talking to Wes about uh, it was raining in San Francisco when he, where he was as well, and yeah. so followed him back. We had a nice sunny week while he was gone, and then uh-huh. now it's... Yeah, I've actually flown through this storm system several times now on the tour. This is one of the things about flying every day, is you fly through the same storm over and over again if you track its course. Yeah. I had one tour through the Southland uh, where there was a, something that had started as like a hurricane and became a tropical storm. And it just walked up and down the Atlantic coast, and I flew through it ten times. And yeah. you know, every time massively delayed, plane buffeted back and forth. I got to really uh, know that storm. We yeah. bonded. <laughs> it's a part of you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting. You you tend to see different patterns, of course, when you tour. You've done you toured quite a bit now for different sure. books and yeah. different things, yeah. and for different foundations and stuff. So I was wondering. Um, how do you deal with tour life? I mean, yeah, you become uh, very uh, sort of robotic. There's the uh, one of the tricks for me is that anytime uh, I'm sitting still, I've got my laptop open and I'm catching up on work. Uh, I have a bunch of things that are not my novel writing that don't stop when I'm on tour. Right. Um, particular, you know, I'm an activist with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And for 10 months now, I've been working on a campaign on a new copyright directive in Europe, which is you know, Europe has these directives that then end up being made into the law in all 28 of the European Union countries. And the copyright directive, it's the worst, most drastic internet law in the history of the Western world. It's, it's on par with some of the Chinese rules. And I've worked on it for the last 10 months, and it came up for a vote yesterday, oh. and we lost. Oh, and we lost in the most horrific way possible, where we lost by five votes. Uh, and afterwards, 10 members of the European Parliament said that they had been confused about what they were voting for and oh. registered a change in their vote. But that registration is only for the historic record. They don't reopen the vote, even if you have a technical majority. And so I was up. I've been up on this tour r- r- routinely at three in the morning, being on calls with people in Europe and doing work in Europe. Uh, and so, yeah, every time I, I, I have a moment, my laptop is open. Um, I, I have a bunch of comfort items that I travel with. I've given up on not checking a bag. I find checking a bag, it gets lost maybe once every two years. And in the meantime, uh, I can have an AeroPress and some coffee and a collapsible kettle and a pair of nice pajamas that I can change into every <laughs> night. Um, I have a swim kit and I make my publisher put me in hotels with with pools and yeah. I, I have a swim every morning. I have a little underwater MP3 player and I load it up with an audio book. A bunch of stuff like that. Perfect. Yeah. A lot of, lot of rechargeable batteries. I am Mr. Lithium Cell. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we interviewed a touring band that had a Pelican case just for their AeroPress. It wow, was, it was really impressive. awesome. <laughs> that is really impressive. The closest I've come to really nerding out on the travel AeroPresses, I've been really tempted to get a Dremel and mill the flange off so that it fits better in the bag. And then maybe <laughs> like a screw fit flange that comes off and pops back on again. Yeah. I also I have a, um, a, a foldable cup 
an origami cup made of a semi, semi-rigid plastic, food-safe plastic, that uh, unfolds into a sheet of A4, yeah. but then you fold it up and it becomes a, a rigid cup that's rigid enough to press an AeroPress into. Because oh. a lot of, especially American hotels, only have paper cups. Right. And it's very hard to do an AeroPress in your paper cup. Right. Yeah. Look at yeah. us. We're talking about the weather and coffee. We it's must be in Portland. Portland. <laughs> yeah. Just adjust your microphone up a Sure. Little. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe we can talk like utility kilts and leather aprons oh. and mustache wax next or artisanal <laughs> beard oil. Perfect. Yeah. You didn't see the Una Una Piper on the way here. No, and I haven't. I haven't seen him on this trip. I have seen him before, though. Yeah, he's yeah. I heard him yeah. earlier. It was great. Yeah, he's always around somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw the uh, some tweets earlier about the the Article Thirteen thing, like the Swedish MPs being like, "No, we we didn't we mean to vote the wrong for this." Button. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there's there's. So there's a bunch of questions about what actually happened there. So one thing we know is that the European presidency, which is Romania, so the presidency rotates around one country every couple of years. And this is the first time the Romanians have had it. And, you know, Romania, it's like an ex-Soviet state, and it's like troubled, and people thought that they weren't going to get anything done and that they would be a basket case, and they're really determined to get this through. And some people think that the presidency, they well, we know that the presidency... Uh, changed the order of voting really confusingly at the last minute, which is what the Swedish MEPs blame their confusion on. Some people think that maybe they cooked the books, that they did it on purpose. But the other thing is that some of the Swedish MEPs who claim to have voted the wrong way are from far-right parties who may have wanted to make like donors or other people happy by voting against the directive, but not alienate their base by voting for it. And so this is a way they can have their cake and eat it. Interesting. Yeah, it's... You know, it's like when, when the things when things are this bad, like first of all, when the rule is this bad, the rule they're voting on is this bad, and then when the process is this incoherent and terrible, it's really natural for people to try and sort of dig into things that seem like weak signals of conspiracies or, yeah. you know, bad behavior because, you know, God, I don't even know what would be worse, right? If this was like a bad UX that destroyed the internet or if it was, you know, a nefarious plot that destroyed the internet. Yeah. A bad UX destroying the internet would be ironic. In yeah. The worst way. I, I call it the Edward Tufty apocalypse. You know, Tufty blamed the shuttle disaster on bad PowerPoint because apparently if you use the default PowerPoint template, the bit where the engineer told his bosses, uh, we should really not launch the shuttle looked like one of our options would be not sh- launching, launching the shuttle just because the way it nested the bullet oh. points. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> PowerPoint kills and absolute PowerPoint kills absolutely. Oh, <sighs> man. That's wild. I hadn't heard that story before. Yeah. Yeah. So much stuff is like that, too. It's like, um, do you understand what you're voting for now? Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> then why are well, you here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, this is why we have representative democracies, right? Because educating yourself on important issues is a very, you know, all encompassing job. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, she gave this interview to, um, Seth Meyer, uh, where he said, how is it that like we had that hearing with, with, uh, Michael Cohen and all the Democrats questions amounted to like, Mr. Cohen, would you say the president is a fucking moron or terrible fucking moron? And you know, the Republicans questions were like, Mr. Cohen, would you say you're a fucking liar or an absolute fucking liar? (laughs) And you were like, Mr. Cohen, I closely read your testimony ahead of time, and I noticed you mentioned this felony no one's been indicted for. Could you elaborate on it and tell the the you know Attorney General of the State, Southern District of New York what he should get a warrant for in order to prosecute <laughs> someone for it? How is it that you are on point, and all these other dipshits are just sitting there like just just doing talking points? She said, "Oh, you have no idea how terrible it is. I have." one Republican colleague who opens every hearing, he uses his time to say to the witness, are you a socialist or a capitalist? Yes or no? <laughs> Which, you know, fucking waste of time. that is a great, I mean, just first of all, it's not a yes or no question, but also, yeah. <laughs> and, and she's like, well, you know what I do? I pay my congressional staffers a minimum $58,000 a year. And so none of them have second jobs working in restaurants. So the night before Michael Cohen testifies, I have people who are on deck who read his shit carefully and yeah. tell me what I should say in Congress. And maybe if they would pay their congressional staffers a living wage, yeah. uh, they would get people who are A, qualified, uh, and B, not working second jobs, right? Because the only, you know, what they get now are you know, upper-class twits 
who, who don't need the money and people who really care about it, but are working three jobs and don't have the mental space to, to care about it. Right. The mental space is super important, especially when you're reading congressional documents that are probably complicated on purpose and, and boring on purpose. (laughs) Right. I mean, you know, a lot of policy fights are, are, are basically like wars of, of different limbic capacities, Right. right? Like if you have the power to, to, to concentrate while bored, you win a whole lot of policy fights. Right. You've been working on on like the policy side of the internet and like copyright and all that for a really long time, like since two thousand two ish. Two, yeah, that that range. Yeah, it's been a long haul, for sure. I mean, you know, long enough that like some of my mentors are dying. Like it's you know, it's been it's been a it's been a long time in, and uh, you know when I. I it's hard not to feel discouraged, but on the other hand, you know, 18 years ago, people were really skeptical that there was a reason to get involved in tech policy. And it's like, why do you want to defend the right of people on BBSs to argue about Star Trek? Right. Right. And I, I had a dinner in like 2006 with a really good friend of mine who comes from a traditional activist background, uh, radical politics. And it was... It was a really disheartening dinner. She really tore a strip out of me. She was like, this is not where politics are going to change. This stuff doesn't matter. Copyright doesn't matter. You know, the, the fighting about copyright is not fighting about human rights. Uh, you know, e- even the most draconian copyright won't make any difference in terms of free speech and censorship uh, and so on. And I just, it left me feeling like really dismissed and, and, and with her feelings that like persisted to this day. And the way that I know that is I ran into her last summer at Comic-Con and I hadn't seen her in years and years because this we had dinner just before I moved back to the UK. And she said, oh, it's really good to see you. And I want to tell you how important I think the work you're doing is. And my guess is she doesn't remember that last dinner we had, right. but <laughs> to have her do this like full volt fast, you know, uh, on this was really vindicating um, because, you know, I, I never thought that the internet was our most important fight, right? Like I, I think, you know, climate change and racial and economic justice and, uh, you know, gender justice and uh, questions of inequality and, you know, a hundred other questions are far more important than the internet, but the internet's like the terrain on which we'll fight about that stuff, right? It's, it's not what we fight for, it's what we fight with. And if we lose the internet, all the other fights are, are lost in advance. And so to have people who fight those other fights come around and recognize that you have to save the internet to save that other stuff, it's been really important. And, and, it, and now it feels like we're part of a movement. Yeah, that's really interesting. 2006 would have been right when you were finishing writing with Little Brother. That's and right. Then- Came yeah. out two thousand eight, right? So that's right, yeah. And that's that's the book that I picked up and read for this interview because uh, uh-huh. I hadn't read much before. Uh-huh. And um, it's it's interesting on Little Brother, but more importantly on the topic you're talking about, is that it has a lot of surveillance state in it. It has a lot of um, infringement about rights, right, and about how people use the internet to get around those infringements. Yeah. And so what I found really interesting about Little Brother um, and then Makers, which I finished today, um, was about kind of the way that oppression creeps in and people try to go around it, but the people that go around it have to use such extreme and kind of different means, mm-hmm. but it's all there. It's already there. Like little brother, for example, had a lot to do with RFID chips and a lot to do with surveillance states and uh, the Xnet, right? The Xbox internet, mm-hmm. which was very interesting to me as someone who only knows the regular kind of, common internet Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then to watch these people go into their own subspace of the internet Mm -hmm. and so i was wondering how much of that stuff has changed since you wrote little brother in this regard in this regard so we see protest movements come up Mm -hmm. on the internet yeah so i think a lot of the particulars are different from those books you know social media is not really present in in either of those books for example Uh, there's a lot of online gaming but not much you know social media no twitter equivalent for example um but some of the stuff that's been enduring uh is really important right so i think that the underlying computer science and its salient questions limitations and capabilities it's pretty stable right like 
since World War II, since you know von Neumann and, and Turing, we've known how to make one kind of computer, right? The von Neumann Turing complete computer that runs all the programs that we can express in symbolic logic. Um, we have notably failed to develop in all that time a computer that can run all the programs except for one you hate, uh, you know, which you know has been a quite a lament for a lot of security practitioners. It'd be really great if we could design computers that couldn't run malicious programs and only good ones. You know, and for better or for worse, that's the technical reality, right? I don't celebrate the fact that we don't know how to make a computer that can 3D print everything except guns, right? right? But we can't. And, you know, uh, you have to start your political uh, interventions with the possible, not with, the, not with wishful thinking. And um, so that has remained stable. The other thing that's remained stable since 2006 is that politicians spectacularly fail to come to grips with this. They continue to regulate the internet as though its most salient fact is whatever it is they're currently upset about. You know, 3D printed guns, pornography, recruiting jihadis, um, you know, any copyright infringement, any number of other things that certainly take place on the internet, but are not the main event of the internet. Um, and the other thing that's remained relatively stable over that time is that um, the consequences of failing to come to grips with the internet and regulating it badly ripple out into other domains. So, you know, in 1998, Bill Clinton signed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and it has this thing called uh, Section 1201 that makes it a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense to remove or tamper with, weaken, or reveal defects in a copyright lock. That was originally used to stop people from like de-regionalizing their DVD players, which, you know, is not a copyright infringement, right? Like going to Europe or Australia or China and buying a DVD and then bringing it home and watching it, it's not a copyright infringement. It's the actual opposite of copyright infringement. Right. What it is is it's a business model infringement because they would like to segment those markets. But, you know, frustrating a, a manufacturer's business model isn't usually a felony. Like felony contempt of business model is a, a new thing. And it was relatively confined, right, to DVD players, consoles, a few other kinds of devices. But the constellation of devices that have copyrighted works in them, which is to say any device that runs software, has expanded to encompass medical implants, voting machines, cars, uh, all manner of devices. And manufacturers are now wise to the idea that if you design a device so that using it in a way that they disfavor would require first removing a copyright lock, that they can make felony contempt of business model into a real charge on the charge sheet. Right? They, they can force you to c conduct your affairs to benefit their shareholders at your own expense, and they can force their competitors not to make devices that would allow you to have more use of your devices, right? not to make independent repair tools that would allow for diagnosis and repair of devices without the manufacturer's permission, to make uh, new consumables for devices from artificial pancreases that have proprietary insulin, which Johnson & Johnson makes, to inkjet printers, to Keurig pods, to, you know, I don't know if you remember the Juicero, which is actually proprietary juice. It's very funny because uh, Wes was briefing me on this stuff last night because I, I had a severe misunderstanding of what it was. And uh, he's like, oh, Juicero. I'm like, okay, I got it now. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. That's a perfect <laughs> example. <laughs> it really is. Hashtag late stage capitalism oh, I right get it. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this, this constellation keeps expanding, right? Um, and not only do manufacturers get to dictate your conduct and dictate their competitors' conduct, they also get to dictate their critics' conduct because security researchers who discover defects in these devices get to um, uh, have to seek permission from the manufacturers before they can reveal news that would lower the manufacturer's share price and cost them sales. Manufacturers are not good custodians of bad news about their own products. And so, you know, since 2006, this law, or, or since 1998, I, I guess, this law has been on the books, but it's certainly since Little Brother came out, this law has only gotten more pernicious and more harmful. And I think that if you want to write relatively future-proof science fiction, Write any story in which computers get more important, computer science remains relatively static, lawmakers continue to make foolish choices about technology, and the consequences continue to get worse. And you will have things that, if not 
uh, predictions serve as excellent parables for the crises that will come in the years to come for as long as I can foresee, which is actually a very depressing thought. In a, in your Google talk recently, last year, 2017, I don't remember, yeah. um, you're talking about Little Brother and you're talking about how it was taught at um, some different Air Force Yeah, the Air programs. Force Academy, West Point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the Naval War College still teaches Did, did they it. ask you about this or did you find out about it? Um, no, they sent me some emails when they did it and then I came <laughs> in and get, did a guest lecture at the Air Force Academy and, the, and West Point, which, you know, as a Canadian whose parents are... Russian refugees and Trotskyists, right. and who is a pacifist <laughs> who advocates for the defunding of the military, it was a it was a really interesting gig to go and do. They, right. they, it was my usual audience, which is great. I like that. Yeah, I mean, how do you feel about it being taught as like cyber? Uh, they called it even, but it was um, it's basically taught as a manual for like how people are going to rebel, right? Well, so, it, yeah, it's taught as, as a manual for, for insurgency and counterinsurgency. Right. Um, I, so here's the interesting thing I discovered about the military academies is, uh, so I've taught at some of the like elite schools, right? I had a Fulbright right. and taught at USC and, you know, I have a MIT uh, research affiliation and so on. And those schools are, I purport to be meritocratic. Obviously, like in this last month, we've learned some things about how anti-meritocratic they are. The academy, the military academies are weirdly meritocratic in that so long as you are willing to die and kill people, the only thing they care about is your grades, right? How smart you are. And so like when you go to West Point, it looks like a big tent, right? Or an Ivy. Like it's, you know, big old stone buildings. It's in upstate New York or it's in, you know, just outside of New York City on, you know, it's very picturesque, got a river. Um, but the kids are browner and poorer than the kids at any Ivy you've ever been to. Because if you actually picked people in America for first class educations based on their aptitude instead of their wealth... Right our Ivies would look nothing like they do. And so these are kids who have pretty um, nuanced uh, political understandings. They want to be officers. A lot of them want to work in policy uh, domains. I was, I was at the Air Force Academy when Trump announced massive funding cuts to uh, the State Department. And these kids were smart enough to all look at each other and go, oh, this means we're going to die, mm-hmm. Right. Because the State Department is what stops you from going to war, right? So I'm conflicted about what these kids want to do, for sure. But of all the people I've met involved in uh, militarism, if not the military, these were the most thoughtful and, uh, I don't know, I guess honorable is the kind of military term for it, uh, people I've met. It was really, it was a really interesting experience. It's like I, I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke when I say it's fun to go outside of my comfort zone and talk to people who are not the people I normally talk to. Mm-hmm. It really is. What surprised me about Little Brother too um, was how much teaching is in it. Yeah, uh, how much? I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. It's a YA novel. It's uh, got a good story, of course, but it's got a lot of baked-in essays about like, oh, this is what encryption is this is how it starts this is how it goes through this is how you got better at it you saw all this stuff is stuff that i probably should have known but right. didn't know but now know because i read a ya novel and that's fascinating to me yeah i mean I, again i know i use the word salience a lot but i think that stories that speculate on the actual capabilities and limitations of technology rather than setting them aside for narrative convenience have a salience that's that's missing in you know your traditional like extruded techno thriller you know product where it's just like we have to get the mainframe i broke the encryption <laughs> right like it, but how <laughs> um and sometimes that works right and and i have a friend i was just on a panel with a friend of mine who was saying that that they have a consultant for the, one of their novels about space program and there are bits where for verisimilitude they will type uh, the captain's saying, we've got a, we've got a, what's it's the who's it's 
before the what's its and who's its happen. Then then they send it off to their expert, and their expert puts in legit space program jargon in there. And and you know, like that's certainly better than just making up words. Sure. But next level is making a story that turns on the actual capabilities and limitations of our uh, aerospace technology, right? And and there's a critiquing term in, in science fiction doing card tricks in the dark. Like when you're doing stuff that's just kind of pointless, um, the stakes in an, um, in an imaginary space program that has no connection to uh, what we know about the limitations and capabilities of, of aerospace are lower and feel lower, like feel more kind of empty calorie than a story where you're actually digging into the real capabilities and limitations. And then, you know, as an activist intervention, writing stories about the limitations and capabilities of computers in the context of people trying to practice technological self-determination and self-defense is, is it's a pedagogical project, right? It, it, it makes people better informed, but it also makes them more curious and more critical in their outlook. And that book now, it's, you know, it's uh, more than a decade old. Right. And I meet like a fair number of security practitioners. Obviously, there's some sampling bias because they seek me out, who say, I am a security practitioner or I'm a computer scientist or I'm a programmer or a developer today because of what I read in that book. Yeah. And that means that not only have I taught a large number of people some technological self-determination skills to evaluate technological claims and push back against them, but also helped uh, with this current cohort of technical practitioners who contemplate the ethical and humane dimensions of their practice alongside the technical questions. And so as an activist intervention, that's extremely powerful. It's interesting. There's um, something sort of related to what you were talking about with like, uh, kind of like taking security into your own hands and like trying to protect yourself from the prying eyes of like the government and all that. I was reading this essay by um, Hito Steyerl, Ste where she talks about, <clears throat> excuse me, she talks about um, doing those things like using services that end to end encrypt your email mm -hmm. or um, using, you know, Tor or mm -hmm. things like this. They're like things that you're doing to hide yourself and to hide your communications from from prying eyes, but they also kind of flag you as somebody sure. who should be looked at because you're using these things. And it kind of creates like this feedback loop of like, mm -hmm. I'm trying to protect myself and that flags me as somebody who should be given extra. Yeah. So I think there are two important glosses that, that help make sense of that. So the first one is that it's this is why it's really important that people who think they have nothing to hide use encryption, right? If you, nothing to hide is another way of saying, I have enough social privilege that I need not fear reprisal even for things people find in my data or things people mistake that uh, and think that they found in my data, right? Um, and if the only people who use privacy tools are people who are vulnerable to retaliation, then you're right, it stands out. Right. But you know, when you have, for example, WhatsApp doing encryption by default, all of a sudden, everybody who uses WhatsApp is encrypted, and no one has got a red sign over their head saying, someone doing something sketchy here, please come have a look, right. <laughs> because they're using an encrypted messenger. Right. So, so if, you have not, if you think you have nothing to hide, that's all the more reason for you to use privacy tools. But the other gloss here is that the purpose of privacy tools and um, tools for technological self-determination not, is not to create a parallel society where people who know how to use privacy tools need not fear surveillance or retaliation and everyone else has to. For one thing, um, there are real limits to privacy tools and the limits are not in whether the encryption work, I mean, encryption works really well. You know, we encryption implemented correctly is so effective that uh, if I scramble a message using my phone's 
you know, normal encryption tools and send it to you. You know, if I send you a, a IM or if I encrypt a message uh, or a photo with my, my phone and hand you my phone and dare you to try and decrypt it. The key is so long. There are so many possible keys that if you converted all of the universe's hydrogen atoms into computers and you asked them to do nothing but guess keys, you would run out of universe before you ran out of possible keys. Right. So the encryption works really well. But the, the thing is that um, in a communications matrix, in a social graph, um, some of the people are using privacy tools and some of the people aren't. And so there's leakage around the edges. And there's metadata as well, right? You can see this person is talking to that person and then that person turns around and talks to someone else and that person turns around and talks to someone else and doesn't use encryption and says, Alice told Bob, told Carol to tell me to tell you that this is happening <laughs> We're all on Friday. secretly meeting outside. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, privacy is a team sport, so there's limits to it. And I think of privacy tools, not privacy itself, but, but privacy tools, encryption tools, as being like, I don't know, like the emergency jack you put under your foundation when your house starts to subside, right? It's the thing that buys you time, right? Ultimately, the thing that protects our privacy and our right to self-determination and our right to equitable treatment is accountable states that are uh, constituted uh, with the consent of the governed and that uh, operate with... Uh, uh, on, on an evidentiary basis and uh, I, in a way that roots out corruption and always guards against it. That's not the state I think we have today, but I think it's a state that we can move towards. And I think that one of the things that privacy tools buys us is a space in which we can plan those things while staving off retaliation, not avoiding it forever, but staving it off, making the job of the authorities to stamp out that kind of subversive activity harder but it's uh, i think that this kind of there's a kind of species of nerd complacency that when people t talk about techno utopianism in dismissive tones that's what they mean the creation of a parallel secondary encrypted universe alongside the mainstream society like a society within a society it is of limited practical use and the best thing you can do with it if you manage to make one of those is plan for figuring out how to make it obsolete by making the society you live in more accountable and democratic. Yeah. It's interesting, the, the way that you talked about, um, you know, if everybody's using WhatsApp, then nobody's red flagged. It's almost like, like privacy tools are uh, some sort of like temporary vaccine that we can all use to help protect each other, kind of not a herd immunity because there's no immunity to the prying eyes of the, of a corrupt state, but sort of at least some sort of herd protection. Sure. And it's, you know, it, we, we're in a moment where we're talking a lot about privilege and what it is and, and what you should do if you find yourself with some, and, and, you know, using privacy tools, if you have privilege is one of the, is one of the many ways that you can try and uh, use your privilege for good. Um, in the same way that if you think back through the last, say, 50 years uh, and the social changes that we've been through and the role that privacy played there, um, you can see it interacting with, with privilege a lot. Like we do a lot of things in this day that were both socially unacceptable and in many cases criminal uh, within living memory, right? Within my parents' lives, say. Uh, gay marriage, smoking marijuana, um, uh, interracial marriage, right? All of these things were, were crimes and some are all of the U.S. Uh, in living memory. And the way that we got from there to here, where all of these activities are, are considered laudable, like not just acceptable, but laudable, and it, in which we regret and, and feel a great shame over the time in which we, we uh, felt otherwise, was not by forcing everyone who was gay or everyone who smoked weed or everyone who was involved in an interracial relationship to um, reveal those facts of their lives to everyone they met. Instead, the existence of a private realm meant that people who had something that they couldn't talk about in the public sphere could choose the time and manner of their disclosures to the people around them. They, they could sit down with people they trusted and reveal the true nature of their identity and their lives to them. 
and recruit them as people who had privilege, who didn't have to fear retaliation, to work on their behalf, right? To work to help normalize this thing, to use their privilege for good. And, you know, one of the corollaries of a world without privacy is that there are people in your life today who have secrets that they haven't told you. I mean, unless you think that in 50 years, your grandchildren will sit around the, <laughs> the table and say, tell me how it was, Grandpa, that back in 2019, we had perfected human uh, <laughs> social progress and have had to make no changes since. Right. People you love and care about have something about who they are that they've never revealed to you, and it, and it pains them. And they're waiting for the day that they can tell you about it and recruit you to be their ally. And if we don't allow people to have a private realm, that day will never come. And those people will go to their graves, never having fully been themselves around you and never having stopped sorrowing somewhere in their heart because of it. And so privacy tools uh, are, are not just about resisting the state. They're also about making social progress, right? Having, having a private realm is also having a realm in which social progress springs. That's very interesting. I, I, I think about this a lot because uh, I'm at a certain age where people will say like, oh, you're going to be stubborn in your views like this forever now. Mm -hmm. Because you're, I just turned 30, getting close to the age where you're stuck forever in this view. Sure. And my whole life has been, or not like from 21 on has been like, what the fuck am I thinking and why? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the stuff I've been thinking about lately has been, you know, is this view that I have now, why is it shocking to someone else or why am I shocked by this other thing? And I think as a society, speaking of those kinds of things you were talking about, gender binaryism and gender issues are still <gasps> so shocking. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why, you know, we need, it'd be, it's going to be interesting to see just like, through gay rights, how gender issues become more normalized in my lifetime later on, hopefully sooner than later, but probably later on. Yeah, I, I, you know, Dan Savage talks about this, and, and I, th I think he makes a really good point, which is that one of the reasons that gay rights have succeeded, I think beyond, say, the, the, the extent to which um, rights for uh, African-American people or, or other, other social uh, struggles have, have succeeded, is that homosexuality and and uh, bisexuality and and other you know non mainstream sexual identities are evenly distributed across all social strata, right? And so once we started to normalize coming out and demanding better treatment, all of a sudden you started to have people who were in the absolute pinnacle of the elites revealing themselves to be gay, right? Now the corollary again of that is that. Well, at the start of the liberation struggle, all the people that you meet who are who are out and gay are also kind of right on, right? They're they're the, the to be out is to is to be politicized and to care about justice struggles. And today, of course, you know Peter Thiel is out of the closet and proud and still a fascist, right? Yeah, it's you know, <laughs> right. and 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 we'll see more of that, right? We'll see more of that with all all other sexual identities and sexualities, non-binaryism and and um, transgender and uh, asexual and all of the rest of it. You will have people who are going to come out. You know, who'll get to to piggyback on the ride that that poor and oppressed people who, who for whom you know reclaiming that stuff really mattered because they they had no privilege to protect them. Uh, they'll get to piggyback on that, and then they will, in the manner of Peter Thiel, go on to be absolute bastards to other people who are in the same plight that 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 they have. You know, in the same way Peter Thiel now you know owns Palantir and and sells surveillance gear to oppressive regimes in which homosexuals are prosecuted. And it's like, that's okay. It's only business, you know, that fucking guy. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. And you know, Lyft does a good trade by calling itself like the fair trade Uber, but Peter Thiel's their major shareholder. Yeah. On the other hand, they lose 41% on every ride. So every time you get into a Lyft, Peter Thiel pays 41% of the fare. More reason to feel good about that. Yeah, Port Portland is a Lyft city. Like yeah, this is one sure. of the few cities where Lyft, Lyft is better beat, than Uber. Lyft beat Uber. So. Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, this is getting this is getting into another area that I'm really interested in, which is that 
Um, the problem with the fruits of capitalism, uh, like the problems with technology, are not what it does, but who it does for and to. You know, if if you could imagine like a cooperative drivers co-op version of Lyft, which in fact you know that happened in Austin when uh, when they or actually it's a nonprofit, it's not a cooperative, but in Austin when Lyft and Uber left town in a snit because Austin wanted to regulate them, the <laughs> the drivers cloned. Lyft, right? It took them like six months. They have a yeah. thing called Ride. It's amazing. And it's just like Lyft, except the drivers get 25% more money, right? Like Amazon without capitalism is actually kind of an amazing thing to contemplate. I mean, yes, we have to replace all the warehouse workers with robots and then just give them, you know, a stipend, like a share of the profits rather than rather than expecting them to, you know, cripple themselves yeah. working in these warehouses. But, you know, a fully automated luxury communist Amazon without any Bezos at the top that's a that's a hell of a future to contemplate. Yeah, well, it's interesting the point about like cooperatives. Uh, be- Portland before Lyft and Uber came in, its major taxi company was a workers cooperative called yeah. Radio Cab. Yeah, and like they struggled so much to get like an app going once Uber and Lyft showed up, and they went through like two or three apps. None of them worked, and it just mm. became like like I I can wait two or three minutes for a lift or I can wait 20 to 30 minutes for a cab. Uh, uh. What am I going to do? Like I want to support the workers co-op, but also like I want to get where I'm going and it becomes like, so this is an interesting area where like technological determinism uh, plays a big role, right? So if you could imagine, um, well, let me take back, let me go back a step. So we live in a very monopolized era, right? Where, where um, firms, really get to control what their competitors can do as we were discussing earlier. Right. In the early years of of the the tech revolution, it was really common for a new company to figure out how to make its product work with the old company's product against the old company's wishes so that customers would have an easy way transitioning from one to the other. So for example, when Facebook started, they had a really big problem, which is that everyone their users wanted to talk to was still on MySpace. And so they made a MySpace login tool that would, you could give it your login credentials for MySpace. It would log in as you to MySpace. It would grab your waiting messages and would put them in your Facebook inbox. And you could reply to them there. And then it would send your replies back to MySpace, wow. right? With a f- <laughs> it's all coming back to the weird phases of yeah. memory. I don't remember that. Yeah, I, was, I totally remember that. I was a late adopter to Facebook. Yeah, so I was, I, w- I was the guy still on MySpace. Sure. <laughs> and this, this stuff, that, it's called adversarial interoperability. Right? Yeah. And it's it's par for the course through most of technology's history. But as firms were able to get bigger and bigger because we had such lax antitrust enforcement, they were able to push for radical interpretations of existing laws as well as the passage of new laws that gave them the right to stop people from doing to them what they had done to their competitors. So a company called Power Ventures uh, made a tool that would log into all the social systems uh, you know, to... Um, uh, uh, Facebook and to uh, Twitter and to uh, LinkedIn and so on and grab all your waiting messages and updates and put them all in one dashboard where you could reply to them and see them and filter them and so on. And Facebook sued them for violating their terms of service. And they used this Reagan era tech law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and stretched the definition of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to encompass this behavior and spent money on fancy lawyers and people who write papers that uh, you know in support of it and and made this interpretation into the law of the land. So imagine that we didn't have this garbage. Imagine we didn't have the DMCA. Imagine we didn't have the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. If you were starting an app today for a co-op, you could build an app that um, paged out to drivers using both Uber and uh, the co-op app or using Uber, say, right? So you could page out using Uber. And then when you made a connection with the driver, your phone and the driver's phone, assuming the driver was in the co-op, would check a third-party service to see whether or not that you're both within the um, within the co-op, we want to use co-ops realm. And if you were, both of you would cancel the Uber and rebuild the ride as a co-op ride. Yeah. Right. And this would solve this interstitial problem of, of of needing to straddle the two worlds. But if you did that, 
Uber and Lyft would sue you under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. They'd sue you under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. They come after you over trade secrecy and tortious interference, and they, you know, they're and in a hundred ways, right? They would attack you. They they talk a good line about capitalism and markets, but what they want are monopolies. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you can like flood flood the market with your product, which is cheaper and faster, it becomes hard for like most people who, who maybe don't have a strong preference towards like Mm -hmm. cooperatives to like just get on board. And then next thing you know, the cooperative can't compete. But if you remove the barriers to competition, then that gets completely turned on its head Yeah, because Uber has whatever $50 billion overhang, (laughs) right? For all the money they've spent, you could start a competitor to Uber that worked exactly like Uber, that piggybacked on Uber's infrastructure, that used the variances in local laws that Uber had paid dearly to get, that used the drivers that Uber had recruited, but didn't use Uber, Yeah. right? And you could build a service that had no capital overhang, that took all the patterns Uber has established in their app, all of the, uh, the um, user behaviors that they've conditioned us to engage in, and you could use it to raid Uber's business and leave them sitting on this giant overhang that they would never be able to trim back. Yeah. Right? You could you could tank them. It would really change this this blitz winner take all style growth yeah. in favor of growth that was at human scale and that was about human thriving and not about allowing rapacious extractive industries to, you know, destroy our communities and and destroy our our livelihoods. If only if only. <laughs> so I should mention, you know, apropos, since I'm on a book tour, that all of this stuff is is themes from the new uh, fiction book, uh, Radicalized. So it's it's a collection of four novellas. And the first one, it's about people in refugee housing. That's a kind of Internet of Things horror house where all of the devices, all the gadgets, all the appliances are designed to extract what little money they have. The toaster only toasts authorized bread and the fridge only refrigerates authorized groceries and the dishwasher only washes authorized dishes. And it's about their journey to first waking up one day and finding that the stuff no longer works because the hedge funds that own it all have tanked the companies. Then figuring out how to jailbreak it and living in a new golden age and then realizing that the companies are coming back out of bankruptcy, that they're going to get caught and that because they've committed felonies, they face deportation to the countries they fled in fear of their lives. And it's a a story about um, technological self-determination, economic injustice, and the fact that the people who get the, the first look, the early adopters of the worst technology we have are the poorest and meekest among us because those are the people who involuntarily are forced to use this stuff. And then, you know, the, the, uh, one, the second story, it's called model minority. It's a story about predictive policing and racial bias, but it's a Superman story. And it's about Superman intervening in a, and a potentially fatal beating, beating of an African American man in Staten Island by the cops who killed Eric Garner. I wrote it after reading, um, uh, Matt Taibbi's book about the murder of Garner by the NYPD called, uh, I can't breathe. And, um, you know, Superman thinks that, after all these years of serving truth, justice in the American way, that he is has all the privilege he'll need, that he is a white man. And what he discovers is that when he abandons white supremacy, he stops being white, he stops being a man, and he becomes an alien. Uh, and also discovers that he thinks that he's in his story, and actually the person whose story matters is the person who's beating you intervenes in, that, that being an ally is not about celebrating your finally showing up for the party. It's about the, the people who've been there since the beginning. And then the, the third story uh, is, is called Radicalized, and it's about uh, entitled middle-class white dudes who are super respectable, who take uh, a break from expressing their rage and frustration uh, by killing their intimate partners and brown people in mosques, and instead start murdering healthcare executives whose bureaucratic choices have killed the people they love best in the world, and about the limits of our willingness to call uh, privileged people terrorists, about the um, uh, problems with the way that we think about radicalization, and about the fact that rights are never given, they're only taken. And then the last story is about a, a prepper, a rich, elitist, 
an elitist in the, in the Peter Thiel sense, someone who thinks that some of us are born better than others, that markets find the best of us and elevate us, and that the way you can tell if someone is worthy is whether they're rich. And uh, he thinks that the time is coming when the world will come to an end, civilization will collapse, and the poors will eat each other, and he needs to get out of the way because someone will come and build a guillotine on his lawn if he's not careful. And so he builds this luxury bunker and fills it with his friends and his thumb drives full of Bitcoin and his uh, gemstone quality stones and, and his MREs and lots of guns. And, you know, he figures that once the dust is settled and some sucker has gotten civilization rebooted, he and his friends can ride out and live a kind of permanent Frazetta painting where they can be, you know, warlords with harems. And what he discovers is that technological collapse is not an option that if technology collapses and it doesn't get going again we have problems that are, will not stop right problems with like just the the problem of the infectious diseases that grow on rotting corpses and uh he discovers in the very hardest way possible that it doesn't matter how many guns you have you can't shoot germs and that the real heroes of the apocalypse are the people who get civilization <laughs> running again <laughs> so does that does that echo some some things from walk away yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a prequel to Walk Away almost. Okay. Yeah. Walk Away I haven't read, but that was what your Google talk was about. And so yeah. it was interesting to hear Walk Away is about um kind of post disaster and what happens, what people think will happen and what actually happens. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um was Unauthorized Bread the one with um the two different entrances to the building where That's like, right, yeah. That's very uh that's very relevant in portland uh, in the moment i think there's a inter- a poor entrance and a rich entrance they don't see each other and the elevator goes back and forth between them there's two different doors right yeah the elevator won't open the stop for you on the poor side if there's someone from the full rent side on the in the elevator right um uh, west knows more about this so i'm talking to him about it but there's um <laughs> in portland there's a problem where uh buildings are supposed to be built with um a low low market in, rents, low income in mind, right? Right, but it's not happening correctly. Is that is that we? Am I wrong about this? I don't know. Well, I mean, like, I mean, that's sort of happening everywhere. Where like, one of the ways that Portland's been trying to, and I think a lot of cities are trying to fix the the housing crisis is that, you know, the cities that are growing way too fast. One one thing that they're doing is they're like building these luxury luxury buildings, saying like, oh well, if we get the rich people out of the regular person market by putting them in these luxury Mm -hmm. it'll bring you know the inventory will go up on the for for regular people and and because the rich people won't be paying for that anymore but the rich people don't want to pay more money they're like oh these these places have been great so yeah and and i think that you know where you have cities that are granting planning variances uh in exchange for low-income units the it has been it has created like weird little pocket apartheids you know in in london where i used to live lambeth council uh granted a planning variance to allow for 149 unit uh development to be built on the site of an old public school state school uh and um it's in a kind of horseshoe shape and, and looks out onto a courtyard with a playground that all the um people who lived there were meant to be able to use and then during the construction, yeah, they, they changed the plan. They fenced it off so that the poor people's houses no longer have an entrance to the playground. Yeah. And the kids can sit in their windows and watch the rich kids play in the playground. But they can't. I mean, it's, you know, like Dickens LARPing yeah. is, is a weird thing to really get into <laughs> in that way, you know. Um, and and so, yeah, this is this is about that idea. I mean, you know the developers are always like, well, you got a subsidized unit. What else do you want? And my answer is always like, well, you, you had planning permission under normal circumstances to build 10 stories. You got to build 15. You trousered $15 million off the back of that variance, effectively at public expense, right? Yeah. Because the public had democratically determined that 10 stories was the limit for this neighborhood. How is that not how is how is it not the fact that you are the major recipient of a subsidy right in this place you know yeah yeah we we are very fast to point out you know like when a regular ass person is getting a subsidy but we have a hard time talking about corporate subsidies and corporate socialism and not so not really socialism corporate you know 
uh, whatever you want to call welfare. it. Welfare. Yeah, corporate welfare. That's yeah. that's what I was looking for. Socialized benefits, pri- uh, socialized uh, um, harms, privatized benefits. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, that's the formal definition of corruption, really, right? It, when when firms can socialize their costs and privatize the benefits, that's, you know, yeah. that's pollution, Yeah. right? I, I, uh, I keep the $100 that I make from polluting. You each pay... Ten dollars to filter your water, and there's twenty of you and one of me, so it costs you two hundred dollars to make me one hundred dollars. But because your costs are diffused and my benefits are concentrated, um, I can effectively socialize my my costs, privatize my my benefits, and then um, I can uh, uh, use some of that excess hundred dollars that I net to uh, lobby for even less restrictive rules that allow me to monotonically expand <laughs> how much profit I have. You know, that's that's the lather, rinse, repeat of of corruption. Yeah. Are you are you a housing advocate? Uh, I yeah yeah yeah. Me too. Portland's been in a crunch for a long time, and mm-hmm. you know we've got the the neighborhood that I lived in before I lived in this neighborhood was one of the neighborhoods where like there was a lot of like little tent tent communities popping up, and mm-hmm. a lot of NIMBY and NIMBYism and um, like, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but there was a guy out there who like put a homemade bomb under an RV, a uh, houseless person's RV. And like, it didn't go off. Luckily, like Jesus his Christ. family figured it out and was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And he got arrested. But like, yeah, stuff like that was happening all the time out there. There was guys who like strung a line across a bike path because houseless people would ride their bikes along that bike path all the time. And they took out a work commuter and all three of them got arrested. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Man. Wow. Yeah. Some weird shit. You know, we live in a moment of extreme economic precarity. Even people who are notionally middle class have no retirement savings to speak of often carrying heavy debt load. Yeah. Literally the only asset that they have in many cases is their home. It's the only thing that makes them have a net positive uh, worth in uh, financially. And um, as a result, we've taken a thing that's a human necessity and elevated it primarily to an asset class. An asset class, moreover, that is very widely distributed, you know, relative although home ownership is at a low. Um, it's still much more widely distributed than, say, ownership of significant numbers of shares or other forms of assets. And so it is a vote-getter for politicians to do everything they can to increase the value of homes. Right. Right. Now, the, this is the problem with making uh, human necessities into assets. You know, if, <laughs> if, if governments, you know, in the course of a four-year term, if a government quadrupled the cost of bread we would call them a dismal failure, but if they did it for houses, then we say that they've made the, the voting as donating as people in society four times richer yeah. and we celebrate them. And this perverse incentive is tearing apart our cities yeah. and our lives. I do feel like uh, on an urban scale, in, at least in dense urban areas, that does feel like it's turning around where, where people are realizing like, single family housing is not actually like a benefit to the, to the broader community mm-hmm. that, you know, higher density is, is more important than having a yard. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and that, that at high density. So I live in a neighborhood outside of LA in Burbank where there, we're having a debate about higher density zoning and we have very, very limited transit. Although, you know, obviously, historically, LA had amazing trends. It doesn't anymore. We do have the world's most extensive bus network, literally, of any city in the world. But it's designed for poor people, and it values their time very uh, at a very low level. So it's hub and spoke. It's super inefficient, slow. Uh, but we, the city is building four new subway lines. And the only way that those lines will end up where we are, or light rail or some other rapid transit will end up where we are, is at a higher density. So it doesn't make any sense to have light rail or subways into low density uh, uh, housing, right? And so right. we would realize not just the benefit of um, 
our neighbors having somewhere to live, yeah. we would also realize the benefit of the additional amenities that are possible. And you know, it's a neighborhood with a lot of independent retail. We have a, a like a two mile long stretch called Magnolia Park that that has no chain stores in it. It's very walkable, very unusual for LA. It's it makes it something of a tourist attraction, and it's fun. You know, it's a fun strip. It's got a lot of uh, studio surplus because we're, we're sandwiched between Warner Universal and Disney. So there's you know, wardrobe surplus, and there's a bunch of vintage stores that serve the costumers and set surplus. We have three year round Halloween stores. It's, it's <laughs> Kung Fu Museum. Like it's, it's a, That's gr- fantastic. a Ouija board <laughs> museum. Like it is a really Amazing. fun little strip, right? Yeah. And um, the thing that makes that sustainable is density, right? Weird stores need high density yeah. because there's the, the average person does not need a lot of vintage clothes. And so you need a lot of people to keep all those vintage stores afloat. We all yeah. love that stuff in our neighborhood. When the landlord started jacking up the rent, we started losing those stores. There was widespread outcry, but it's hard to, to make the connection between that and, oh, we should, we should have a couple of giant apartment buildings in this yeah. neighborhood too. Well, and you also get like the like chicken and egg situation of like, Oh, we can't build transit here because it's not high enough density to need transit. Oh, right. well, we can't build higher density stuff here because we don't have transit that serves to support it. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, Pasadena is a really interesting example of how they kind of squared that circle. They um, eliminated free parking, which in LA it's you know normally a, a a vote loser. Yeah, they built four pay garages, right? So they built these these high density garages that got the cars off of the streets. They use the revenue first to, to pay for the garage, but then to pay for um, transit and street level improvements. New street furniture, loads of street level maintenance, wider sidewalks, uh, a lot of things that, that have now made that into a really diverse, highly desirable retail environment. And so it, it flipped the retailers who are no normally like absolutely four square against eliminating any parking because yeah. you eliminate parking, you eliminate footfall, right? And what they did was figured out how to eliminate parking, parking while raising footfall. And they brought the retailers on side and it's been great. I mean, you know, d- downtown Pasadena, it's, it's, it's a lovely walkable, fun neighborhood. Yeah. It's like uh, here in Portland and I don't even know how many people in Portland know this at this point, but we have the streetcar, which is like kind of a smaller train that runs through yeah, downtown. It's light rail. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in Toronto. We have streetcars. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got, we've got the, the main light rail with the max lines and then we've got streetcars, which are mostly just downtown and inner Southeast. Sure. And the reason the streetcars went in was to get people walking in uh, business neighborhoods, like businesses with a lot of retail. Uh-huh. It wasn't to move people quickly to work it was like to move people slowly along high density retail routes huh. to get people like into these neighborhoods that had like a lot of little shops a lot of little businesses sure and not to like get them from point a to point not b to as quickly as possible that's really interesting yeah yeah i mean when you compare different retail neighborhoods in la you know the 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 walkability and the restrictions on cars and the density really make a difference. So, you know, Melrose, which is a very famous retail strip, it's really ungainly. It's very spread out. It's very low density. Um, and even if you go there with a car, uh, so, you know, you, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can walk the whole length of it, which is sort of like a half day, and then you're at the other end. Yeah. And you need a, you need, you have a long walk to get back. And if you <laughs> bought anything, you've got to drag it around with you. Or you can you know, do a block or two, get back in your car, drive a couple of blocks, do a block or two, get back in your car, drive a couple of blocks. <laughs> oh, it's what a really <laughs> ungainly, right? It's And it's really got to limit the, the actual retail activity in the neighborhood, you know, uh, relative to a higher density uh, retail environment. You know, and I suspect what happens is what, what happened with us when we moved to LA, we found a couple of places we liked, a cool comic shop and, you know, one place that had t-shirts I liked or whatever. And we go by and we, we visit them, you know, if we're driving past, we might pull over, but we don't walk around the neighborhood. Yeah. Right. And so the, the, those, um, virtuous cycles that you get with retail where a bunch of stores, but get a bunch of other stores to, to kind of capture each other's footfall, that's, um, that's not happening as far as I can tell in Melrose. And it may be why Melrose is becoming a lot more boring. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of, 
downtown a little bit like downtown portland is just getting more and more boring it's I getting just don't go there <laughs> yeah like, I, I live on the east side and and i have everything i need yeah. uh, walking from my house you know yeah yeah and so which they're trying to fix they're trying to like eliminate yeah. parking minimums and things like that and mm-hmm. you know uh like expand bike lanes and all that downtown mm-hmm. M- more active mm-hmm. transport uh but it'll be interesting it's, it's slow going as yeah. these things are yeah it's interesting there's a collection of vegan businesses that rented out a whole set of building uh-huh in, in uh-huh. the stark area and so there's four shops right in a row that are all vegan establishments mm-hmm. and it's kind of away from everything else there's nothing else really around there except for a dog park and now there's a concert hall and the new season's headquarters but otherwise there's nothing else really around there and so i try to go there every week to support the small businesses and and it's interesting that you have all these people sustaining on each other Right, like each other's footfall, you know, each other's traffic. Yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, I'm gonna go to the clothing store and the bakery and the store, and if I right. really want a tattoo, I guess I go to the tattoo shop too. <laughs> it's a vegan tattoo shop. Yeah. Yep. Do they? Do they? Will they tattoo an animal on you? They will. Um, the, the inks are the problem. Okay. Yeah. So it's, well, it's, and the transfer paper, transfer paper, and yeah. the uh, some people use gelatin based petroleum right. or weird shit like that. Yeah. that. But they w- they will tattoo an actual animal. Yeah, they will. It's a dead animal too, which is kind of upsetting to me personally, but it's their <laughs> business. Um, but yeah, they'll they'll tattoo all kinds of shit on you. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just interesting. You, you see some collectiveness like that, and it mm-hmm. makes it makes it good. There's another that group started another group of stuff further out about a hundred blocks away from there um, in a different neighborhood. And now it's a bakery and coffee shop and same store. Mm-hmm. And so you start mm-hmm. to see these collectives pop up. Which is sure. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 When I was a kid and getting into Dungeons and Dragons, we had a, a one block Very stretch. Surprising. Yeah. <laughs> tell me about it. We had a one block stretch where uh, there were like three D and D stores. Wow. And that was, you know, after school we get on the subway, we ride down to, Bloor and Young, and we walked down to Wellesley on Young Street, and we go to all the D and D stores. The best one, Mister Gameway's Ark, had like a four story building, and the top floor they played RPGs all day. It was just a clubhouse, but they had a full scale replica of the bridge of the Starship Enterprise from the first series. <laughs> wow! <laughs> it was so wow. good. Oh Man. my god, it was good. <laughs> That's amazing. amazing. Yeah. yeah, I grew up in a small town, so like I had to go like. 30 minutes to get to the closest game shop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, it's like it was not just D and D. It was like, we have to do every game and uh-huh. our, our business is supported on selling magic, the gathering cards. Yeah, and sure. And I just, did. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's still the case. Now there's still a lot of small comic book shops that sell magic stuff. Just sure. To yeah. Make yeah. A living. I, I did a gig uh, once in Norway and in Bergen and I went into their D and D store, which is also their goth store and also their head shop. And also the, it's like, <laughs> it's like just subculture emporium. Yeah. Yeah. Comic store, science fiction <laughs> store. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Wes and I used to live in a different duplex apartment up the street from here on this street. And um, it was amazing. It was my, it was my first, time living in the da- in the downtown area I lived in the suburbs before that and um this street is really good for that because it's like there's food carts really good coffee comic book store synthesizer shop mm. and so i had like everything we needed nice. right in a row <laughs> and we just like walked the block i think i saw that episode of portlandia yes yeah, uh, yeah. it's a documentary it's, yeah. it's not yeah. a joke I, in fact the food cart the food cart episode of Portland it was literally filmed in the food carts <laughs> up the street from here. Really, the Excellent. ones that we are talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, very good. So you yeah. did see that episode? Yeah, of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's so nice just to have good stuff around here. Yeah, but walkability is important. Yeah. So what's after this? Oh, oh, dark hundred tomorrow morning. I go to Seattle. I'm going to be on Dan Savage's podcast. That's oh, nice. super exciting. Cool. Uh, I'm doing an event at the library tomorrow night, and then I go to Anaheim for WonderCon. My family's going to come down, uh, and then I go home with them. Uh, my wife goes out of town next week, so we <laughs> two sheep that passed in the night. Uh, and then uh, most of next week, I'm doing radio and TV satellite hookups and remotes, uh, and then I'm got a week to kind of catch up on work and then I go back out again. Uh, Halifax, Toronto, Ottawa, uh, Berlin, and then Houston. Um, and then, uh, God, I, then we're getting into like, I don't know what, yeah, but right. I've just, I've just finished the rewrites on the third little brother book and I oh, want to nice. do one more pass on that. 
And I've got an essay collection coming out. I've got to write an essay, a final essay for it, a kind of capstone. Um, and uh, I've got a picture book coming next year that we're just wrapping up uh, about a little girl who um, is really into monsters. It's called Posey the Monster Slayer. Nice. Uh, she's really into monsters. And one night, um, the monsters come into her room, you know, Dracula and Frankenstein's monster and so on. And she improvises field expedient monster killing weapons out of these super gendered girly toys. Uh, <laughs> And so I got to kind of wrap that up and we got to figure out what we're going to do about this European vote. I, I'm oh, yeah. trying not to think too hard about it because just it, it really makes me want to, you know, smash my laptop. Like, I can't believe how unbelievably terrible that vote was. Yeah. yeah. Um, selfishly, do you have a little bit more time? Sure. Yeah. I selfishly want to talk to you about writing process. Sure. Uh, Cause you were talking in your Google talk about that and I had some questions. Yeah. Um, so you said that you normally set a, word count for your day or a general area and you just go for it and then yeah. stop mid sentence or mid whatever yeah and then pick up from there later and also something interesting about that was that you you generally just leave you know benchmarkers in for like this needs more research or this needs more whatever yeah little and don't TK. worry about it at that yeah, point yeah that's right so yeah, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, you basically just summarized I know. it. Really. <laughs> I realized it as I was saying it. Yeah. I was like, you got to stop talking so you can talk. So the best, the best advice I ever got about writing that I didn't take for many years was to write every day. Um, habits are things you get for free. They just happen automatically. And uh, writing every day is easier if you have some um, tips and tricks to help you. So one is, as you say, finishing the middle of a sentence gives you a couple of words that you write for free. Uh, without having to think too hard about it, and then you kind of the, you're, you're in gear and you can start rolling. Um, excuse me. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, and and um, the other thing is to uh, have a general sense of how you want to move the plot along. And for me, I think plots are when you have people in places who have problems who try to solve their problems intelligently, fail through no fault of their own, such that the problem gets worse, and now they have a new problem to solve. And if you follow that gradient, there's always escalating tension and escalating sympathy for the character. Um, and so as I write, uh, I try to stay in the moment and I try not to get distracted with uh, things that might lead you down a click hole. So, you know, if someone is contemplating the Brooklyn Bridge and I want to say, you know, all however many feet of it, I just write TK feet of it. And then later on, I go back and search for all the TKs in the story. Even stuff like if there's a minor character I want to reference again, and I can't remember what they're called, rather than page back through and find what their name is, I'll just put like TK minor character name mm -hmm. and, and then go back and fix it at the end. Um, is that something that you had to progress into or did you have that idea early on to be like... No, I definitely had to progress into it. That, to me, that sounds like such a deterrent from my process, but a, but a good one. like in, yeah, in, sure. Meaning that I constantly get stuck in this habit of like, okay, I got to read back through what I wrote yesterday and then I got to continue on from there. Yeah. And I got to remember fucking Susan's name and I got to go yeah. through. And where so was I, she? I, uh, so I think that uh, one of the most liberating realizations I had is that although there were days when I felt like I was writing well and days when I felt like I was writing poorly, and although my, my first drafts had good stuff and bad stuff in it, that those two weren't correlated. Right. That how I felt about my work was much more strongly correlated with things like my blood sugar and my sleep and my anxiety levels mm -hmm. than it was with the uh, absolute objective quality of the work that day. When you have that realization, you can just write. Um, I also realized that... Uh, the problems of fixing continuity loom really large in the moment. It's easy to feel like you've, you're losing track of all the moving parts. But in practice, it is very rare to have the kind of continuity problem that takes more than a few seconds to fix. Right. You can, and especially if you signpost where you think you're having a continuity problem, it's really easy to go back and find it. Because that's the other thing I worry about is that you know in the moment, I will give the character a name and then forget that I need to go back and look it up uh, and see whether or not that's the same name I gave them last time. But again, if you signpost it, then when you're done, you know, when I, I just finished the third Little Brother book and it's really long, it's going to have some cuts, but it's 170,000 words in first draft. So very long book. And as I was writing it, I had this sense that it was just full of TKs, right. just full of them. And I finished it and it took me an hour to knock off all the TKs. Like it was not full of TKs, it was really easy, yeah. you know? 
um, it is less daunting than you think it will be. The, all that stuff just kind of looms in your mind because it's unfinished business. Right. And then you, of course, do a couple of different types of writing. Of course, this is blog writing. And the yeah. You know, uh, for the e EFF writing. And so do you have a cert, do you have to work into fiction or is it just whatever is next on the docket? Yeah, it's just next? whatever's next on the docket pretty much. Again, like what I realized was that although I am comforted by doing ceremonial things and getting in the mood and having a, I don't know, a deck of inspiration cards or whatever sure, it is you're sure. supposed to do, uh, it had no empirical effect on the quality of the work. And uh, moreover, it is expansionist, mm -hmm. right? You start with two rituals and you have four and then you have eight and then the rituals uh, expand to swallow the time you have available for work. And that ultimately what starts as a comfort becomes its own source of anxiety. And so I've just stripped all that stuff away. And in part, that was out of necessity. I started really selling books while I was EFF's European director, and I was traveling 27 days a month, and I was in 31 countries in three years, and there was just like no way I was going to be able to, you know, shave the cat and wash the dishes, <laughs> yeah. you know, and light some incense yeah, every I time say. I wanted to write. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You were talking in that in that um, talk as well about writing in cars on the way to things, and yeah while someone else was speaking at the podium before you or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. and just getting the time in as long as the, the yeah. word count got there. I did some work in the cab on the way over here and at dinner and yeah. And I was, you know, today was um, store signing day. So I went to a whole bunch of stores all over the greater or Portland area. I spent most of the day in cabs going back and forth. And I got a ton of work done. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Well, great. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, I really thank appreciate you. it. It was a really fascinating interview. It was really nice to meet both of you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. All right. And that was our interview with Corey, Dr. Rowe. Yeah. Really fun. Really yeah. nice. Really nice person. Super nice. Super nice. Uh, I had a really good time talking to him about all the internet stuff. Like it's stuff that like I think about, but I haven't like really talked about it in a long time. Right. I don't really have a lot of people that I talk to about that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so which, was, I'm sh which is interesting. Cause I'm sure that some of the people you wouldn't think would be super into talking about it. Like I'm sure like um, some of the games people would also be super oh, nerdy yeah. internet people. No, I, <laughs> for sure. There's people in the games community who are, who are like that. But like, usually we're talking about like, usually like we're barely even talking about games, <laughs> but it's, it's all Japanese reality shows. <laughs> it's all and, Terrace house, yeah. all Terrace house all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Super fun interview though. Yeah. Super nice guy. It's a really long one. So catch up real quick. What's yeah. going on? You got anything going on? Uh, it, have we recorded an outro since I got back from GDC? No, but we should save that for a longer episode. Okay. <laughs> we'll save that for a longer episode. I went to GDC yeah. and I found it way too expensive, incredibly yeah. inspiring. It was worth it for me, but if you don't have the money, I can see like it's it's such an exclusionary event, which is super problematic. Yeah. Uh, I like oscillated between really excited about being at GDC and really angry about all the people who can't be at GDC because of yeah. how inspiring it was for me. That's really interesting. We should really talk about that. We got time. So I feel the same way about everything lately. It's so weird. Yeah. It's either really in the cultural, you know, zeitgeist at the moment, or it's turning 30 and looking at all the money and all the things that we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Maybe it's like that sense of like, Oh, I have to spend money responsibly because I'm a fucking adult. I yeah. <laughs> Well, but, I feel that way about AWP, which was last weekend as well. I didn't get a chance to go to. And there's a lot of free events surrounding AWP. Yeah. But the actual legit event where the connections are made and where the editors are and where the talks are right. was hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And it was like, just like GDC. It was hundreds of dollars. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, the, so GDC, I got like the cheapest pass, yeah. which was hundreds of dollars. Yeah. The pass that get would get me into most talks yeah. was... The the lowest pass that would get me into most talks was a thousand, and the all access pass is Jesus two thousand. Christ! On top of it's in San Francisco, where yeah. the average meal for a single person costs twenty fucking dollars. Wow! And like 
have fun finding a cheap place to stay anywhere in San Francisco. Yeah. So like it's in like one of the most expensive cities in the country. It's one of the it's in an incredibly expensive conference just to go to. Right. And like yeah, it's just like I I got a a pass that let me go to the expo floor, which is I think what was one of the most valuable parts of it was right. being able to like there's a section of the expo floor where it's like all indie game developers right. who have been nominated for awards. Uh, so all their games are set up, all the developers are hanging out and it's developers hanging out with developers. So like you can actually connect with like people who do what you want to do on like a personal we're all human beings level. Right. Whereas like at PAX it's like it's that's a way more consumer focused convention. So like the developers who are there tend to be there in like I have to sell my game mode. So not that you can't make a human connection there. I made a couple connections there that I really enjoyed talking to those people. Right. But there's also people who are clearly clearly in like man, there's like a million people who like to buy video games here and I have to like I just talked to all of them. I have to pitch my game. Which is understandable. Yeah. They probably paid thousands of dollars to do that. Yeah, they definitely paid money to do it. Right. I, I have no idea what the tabling costs at packs are, but like yeah, like Yeah. It, it, AWP is the same way where it's it's expensive to do everything, including to volunteer, which is really fucked up. That's one thing GDC does have for it, is that to be one of the uh uh conference associates you apply, they pay you a stipend for that day and cover your meals for that day, and right. then you get an all-access pass, which is valued which at two thousand yeah. dollars. <laughs> That's a good payment. Yeah. So, but it's just interesting how many of those things are exclusive and hard to get into for yeah. people who don't have any money or aren't willing to go into debt. Yeah. And it's like it makes it reinforces this weird thing that I have about about things being given to people who have money where it's like only people with money can get far in any creative endeavor. And it's, that's fucked up because it's not true always. Yeah. But it feels that way. But it feels that way from the outside. And something that's also fucked up is like, I don't have money. Yeah. Like I, I am at like the top of broke. Right. I'm not, I'm not like, doing badly i'm doing pretty good yeah but i'm still pretty broke yeah and like i see stuff about like grants or scholarships for things where it's like technically i could probably qualify for that but like i would feel like a shithead if i got a grant as a guy who's like a cis white employed het (laughs) employed like male who is doing pretty well for myself right. and can like afford a little bit of debt. Right. Like a little bit of debt isn't going to hurt me as bad as it's going to hurt people who are like fucking struggling. Right. You know, and those are the people who should get those grants. But like, I also want to do those things and yeah. I also don't have the money to do them. So it like creates this conflict in, in me, like you were saying, yeah. like, yeah, like, I don't want to apply for things that I could get a lot of use out of because I feel like other people deserve them more. Right. Which is kind of a weird territory to talk about. Cause it's like, Oh man, poor middle class white dude can't get a break in creative I'm, world. I'm, def- I'm not saying <laughs> I know. that. I'm I definitely know. not saying that. Like, I, know. I legitimately believe other people need and deserve it more than I do. Exactly. But as a person who wants it, <laughs> it's hard to, <laughs> come to terms with <laughs> yeah so that's that's interesting I, I feel that way often lately and it's hard to get over that yeah where it's like oh you you got published because you know a shit ton of people because you paid to go to the parties and you paid to go to the school where all the people hang out and you paid to go to the fucking rich cafes or whatever <laughs> it's like a real bummer yeah i mean I'm realizing this more and more, but like all this stuff really is about like making like it's all it's all about networking. Yeah, like it's not about the the talent has to be there. And yeah, the, and the and the dedication has to be there for sure. Yeah, but it's like fifty percent or more networking and social activity. Right, which is crazy because a lot of artists I know are super 
antisocial. <laughs> isn't, isn't it funny how like <laughs> and in, in order to be a successful creative, like a lot of creatives don't have great social skills. Right. But in order to be a su- successful creative, you need to have really good social skills yeah. <laughs> or at least be able to fake having really good yeah. social skills. Yeah. It's very interesting for sure. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's pretty funny to me. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a it's a weird it's a weird thing. <laughs> I need to I need to figure it out for myself because I I need to get out over it and just do what I need to do. Yeah, and not be such a weirdo about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, give me your quick capsule review of us. We went and saw us. No spoilers. Uh, us was really good. Uh, it had you have to go into it and just like ride with it. There's some things that don't make sense if you think about them too hard. Yeah. But like they serve the plot and that feels more important to me than like any sort of like literal making sense. Um, I felt there was a couple moments towards the end that were a little weak. Uh, But overall I thought it was a really great movie and I would watch it again. Yeah, that's fair. I feel the same way. I feel like it's uh, I I know when I've seen a decent to good movie when we can talk about it for a long time afterwards. Yeah, we talked about it for a while afterwards. Yeah, and not just like, oh, that was pretty good. I like this part. Oh, the colors were nice. Like we were talking about like eight different possible <laughs> interpretations of the events of the film. <laughs> right, and, and teaching each other things, which is yeah. my favorite part of seeing movies that make you think. You yeah. Know? Like Suspiria is a good example of that, where we did talk a lot about it because it was a very beautiful movie, yeah. but its social consciousness was not not too deep. Uh, it had some moments, but our conversation surrounding it afterwards. Our wasn't. conversation about Suspiria afterwards was like totally about the um, the like cinematography and like how that movie felt and the mood of it. But like I've been watching stuff about it recently, and it's like, oh fuck, I totally missed like this aspect of right. it or that aspect of it, right? And like now, I want to go back and like rewatch it with like a lot of different stuff in mind, a, a bunch of different stuff in mind, and also just like see what I missed from the first time. Right, right. Yeah, it's very interesting. I really Red Letter Media did a review of they did the old Suspiria and then the new Suspiria. Yeah, I haven't watched that yet. It was really interesting. Really good. Yeah, They're, they also liked the new one better than the old oh, one. Oh, good. Which. Like I feel bad about, but it, the new one is better oh, as I, a movie. The old one's beautiful, and I love it. I feel, but I feel it's okay about it. so <laughs> hard to watch. Yeah. front to back. Yeah, I feel okay. <laughs> I feel okay to the new one. It would be hard pressed if the if the new one was worse than the old one. If it was just the same but different, like yeah. that's different. Yeah, I feel like the new one is better as yeah. a movie <laughs> oh yeah i think the the new one is like the new one's like what three hours two yeah. and a half hours something like that yeah. and i think it is it never lags yeah it's totally watchable front to back like the original suspiria is beautiful it's really interesting the sound is interesting but there are spots in that movie that are just like come the fuck on <laughs> Yeah, it's exciting. The Red Letter Media review of us was very interesting, too. Yeah, I thought so as well. Yeah, good. Got anything to add? Nope. So if he says no, full of Thai food. A wag of the finger. That's what's up. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if, if you uh, just tuned into the Corey Doctor episode and you made it this far, where should people listen next? Uh, what other question. episodes would people love if they listen to our Corey Doctor episode? What What are you into? Because I know the people who are into Cory Doctorow are into all sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, probably video games might be a good place to go. So sure. we've got interviews with people like Steve Gaynor of Fulbright. Uh, Carla. Of Carla Zavonia of Fulbright. Uh, we've interviewed Nina, um, who is also at Fulbright, but she also makes her own games. Uh, things like Sybil and... Um, God, I can't think right now. Uh, how do we do it? Um, <laughs> yeah, so video games might be a good place to go if you're if you're uh, new to our podcast. Uh, what about comics? Comics. Uh, we've interviewed a few comics people. Um, we've interviewed. Yeah. So most recently, we interviewed Sabine Rear about her independent comic creation and wrestling, yeah. <laughs> which was a great interview. And then we've also interviewed. Um, Quite a few different people um, who are all blanking 
all gone from my mind. Yeah. What's sad is we, we <laughs> interviewed a comics writer who's fantastic, who I had so much fun in that interview, but every time I try to think of her, it like blanks in my mind. And then as soon as I'm not like recording, I'm yeah. like, oh yeah, her name is this, but it's totally blanked in my mind. Comics right now. writer. Yeah. Oh, uh, yep. Exactly. Yeah. Man, it was an early interview. Yeah. Yes. Jen Van Meter. Jen Van Meter. That's right. Jen yes. Van Meter was an early interview of ours, but it was so fun. Yeah. Um, she was really fun to talk to. Yeah. Uh, what about other creatives? Yeah. Kelly Fitzpatrick. is a colorist. Yeah. I can never remember. <laughs> so there's, there's two, a bunch of Kellys we interviewed. There, there's a bunch of, well, there's a couple like well known Kellys in comics. And That's I, true. I don't, I always want to yeah. make sure I don't like So Kelly Sue DeCormick them. is the other one who's way too famous for us right now. Yeah. Unfortunately. Kelly Sue DeCormick is like uh, the one person that we've been asking for an interview for the whole time we've been podcasting. No, no shade on her. She's no. just legitimately busy. Yes. And, and and her publicist and I are like best email friends now because <laughs> I email her every six months <laughs> for the last five years. <laughs> but understandably, Kelly has gotten very busy with Captain Marvel, which yeah. she wrote. Yeah, congratulations to <laughs> so, her. So <laughs> understandable. <laughs> um, but yeah, other... And other, she had a cameo in the movie. Oh, I didn't know that. I haven't yeah. seen it yet. That's great. That's exciting. Good for her. Uh, yeah, we're based, we're a podcast based in Portland, and we interview creatives and musicians and everything else. Yeah. And so uh, the best place to find us right now is TalkingToGhost.com. It's the only good website on the internet. That's right. <laughs> it's the only good website on the internet. Or, <laughs> or uh, God damn it, I can't remember what Corey's website's called. <laughs> Bug oh, Boy. No, C- Crap Hound. Crap Hound. <laughs> That's right. Crapan.com. So there's a few net? good boing good. boing net. <laughs> yeah, few good websites. Uh, but, but talking to ghosts is where you find all your good creative interview content. That's right. That's right. Uh, and that's it. That's all I got. That's all we got. So uh, remember, everybody, we're all just ghosts waiting to die. <laughs>